Cool. Well, we'll get started here. Thanks everyone for joining us. We got uh, so psyched to have Andy Sovic from Beacon Guidebooks here today um, and excited to show you um, some of the stuff that we've been working on. Um, so I'm Charlie Von Avis, a uh, uh, product manager at Onyx Backcountry. Um, love to ski, love to backcountry ski, um, and then do all the trail stuff in the summer. Um, I've been working here at Onyx for uh, almost five years uh, and kind of am uh, sort of one of the part of the group that's getting Onyx Backcountry um, uh, and, and making it an awesome product for, uh, for backcountry skiers. Um, and I'm excited to have uh, Andy Sovic, um, the founder of Beacon Guidebooks, um, author of a few of those guidebooks as well. Um, and so Andy, yeah, introduce yourself, tell people who you are, what is Beacon and um, how long you've been in the game of writing great books for, uh, for backcountry skiers. Yeah, um, we're based in Gunnison, Colorado. I grew up uh, in just north of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, skiing around there, mainly kind of cross country skiing on old skis and stuff like that in the 80s. And uh, moved to the Western Slope of Colorado about uh, 24 years ago and have been here ever since uh, skiing a lot obsessively. And about 10 years ago, I started Beacon Guidebooks. And that's a pretty liberal way of saying I wrote a flip photo book for Crested Butte where I was uh, living and skiing at the time and um, mainly just took photos and put together a little book. And ever since then, the, the company, the concept, the idea and the product results have taken off. And I think we've completed 27 products as of this month uh, since then. And uh, right and in print and published, we have nine books in Colorado, nine maps, and then same in Washington. So, so, and uh, we also have an avalanche search and rescue book that is meant to be kind of a compendium summary of, of all the different things you learn uh, in rescue of avalanche accidents. And then we have a children's book called Squeak Goes Backcountry Skiing this year. It's a total uh, branch off of the tree for what we're doing, but it's been a really fun product and, uh, and really fun project. It's a fundraiser for Protect Our Winners. So that's kind of the, the short and skinny journey of uh, beacon guidebooks but we're basically in the business of making atlases maps and apps for backcountry skiers in hopes that we make good decision making tools that help people plan and execute really good safe successful adventures in the backcountry awesome um yeah i'm excited to read squeak it's uh <laughs> i've never read a children's book about backcountry skiing and definitely getting that for my niece yeah, um, it's, the, it's, it's the definition of a niche right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So today we're going to go over um, uh, a couple things like um, mostly to demo um, the Onyx Backcountry product and kind of walk through some of the basics of the app as well as, you know, in our partnership with Andy and Beacon, like how we're using a lot of the curation and content that he's created and put into the app. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, reliability and responsibility of, of that information that we put out there and kind of how do we be good stewards for the backcountry skiing community. Um, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of like, how do you plan a ski tour with, with Onyx? Um, what are the tools that we have available uh, in the product so that you can, um, you know, maximize your, hopefully have, find great snow and, uh, and stay uh, safe. Um, so without further ado, we will dive into that. Um, well, I guess with further ado, um, scan this uh, QR code and um, you'll get 30% off of, of Onyx Backcountry. Um, I'll hold this up here for a few more moments um, just to give you the opportunity to, to scan that code. Um, but yeah, you can choose a one month trial or 30% off. Cool. I think we'll throw this up at the end too. So if you missed it, no problem. And we're going to move on. Um, so quickly for those, here that are less familiar with Onyx, really um, quick overview. We'll get into the product and we'll go into the detail on all this, but we're a GPS map um, uh, on your mobile phone and on the web for uh, human powered adventure. So we have um, maps for, for trails in the summer and for backcountry skiing and snowshoeing and uh, in the winter. Um, we have we bring in data very specific to each of those to help planning um, complex or simple um, adventures. Um, and we have a whole bunch of features 
uh, and data that that kind of that support this, which we'll go into detail um, in today. And what makes us different? Um, these are just some themes to keep in mind. Like as we, and we'll we'll talk about them as we go through. But um, Onyx Back Country prides itself in being reliable. Um, we've built our map from the ground up, and um, we have a long history um, uh, over a decade of of building maps for outdoor recreationalists. Um, we're we pride ourselves in our usability um, and how intuitive Onyx is to use for beginners and for experts. Um, uh, our content, and we're talking about that a little bit today, but we uh, we take a lot of care to make sure that we're we're sourcing and bringing in really good content to show on the map. Uh, privacy, um, we uh, one we do one to one sharing only. We we lock down your user data. Um, we don't. We're, we try to be very responsible with with the information that that um, our users have in our app. Uh, and finally, purpose driven. Um, we're committed to uh, protecting public access um, and being good stewards. Uh, and supporting the avalanche community um, and promoting good safe practices in, um, in avalanche terrain. So one of those first tenets there was reliability. And that's something that we share with, with Beacon where um, reliability and responsibility of information is part of their ethos. Um, so Andy, I'll throw it over to you. Like, what does it mean to be reliable and responsible um, for backcountry skiers? And, and how do you practice that um, in your work at uh, at Beacon. Yeah, it's, it's a big subject, Charlie, and it's one that I, I take very seriously. And I try to come into the conversation with some humility that um, it's reliability and responsibility is it's almost like a horizon that you were an ideal that you're chasing and that you're really, really striving for. And um, when we're cranking out products, the way that we do, uh, we're bound to run into situations where maybe the way we said it can be interpreted a different way. And it's an ever evolving conversation. So I like to approach it from humility and not try to tell everybody in the audience that I am the most reliable and responsible source of information and I can replace a mountain guide in any given field. It's, it's just not true, first of all. And uh, it's important to stress that, uh, that the backcountry is a, is a dangerous place inherently. And um, the, the goal is to make products and whether it's a paper book, a paper map, or an app that are as reliable as possible. Um, but what does it look like? What does it actually mean? We can talk about it. I have it all over my website. I have it all over my marketing and promotional materials. I mention it in commercials, all that stuff. Uh, you can talk about it, but what does it mean to do it? Um, the way we approach our guidebooks, first of all, is I wrote the, the book for Crested Butte because it's a place that I'm intimately familiar with. I know the zone and I've skied most of those routes many, many times over. And I have a lot of uh, connections and sources of, of other information and a lot of friends. <clears throat> the Avalanche Center that helps talk about all, the, all this information and uh, helps um, fact check and and double check and triple check all the routes and the descriptions that we have, including slope angles, the aspect, uh, the descent lengths, eights ratings. We'll get into that later. But uh, avalanche train exposure scale ratings is a big piece of what we do that uh, should help provide good information to the skier. But what do I do with uh, all of our other products? That's one of, of 18. It's, it's one of 20 plus products that we have, including the maps. Uh, how do we go about this? So I usually find, or an author finds me, I find an author, an author finds me. They say, you know, I really like the atlases that you make. I'd like to make one for my zone. Uh, for example, I'm a local mountain guide. We could use a resource like this when we're guiding our clients, when we're teaching our avalanche classes. And, uh, so how do we do this? And the reliability and responsibility of what we do starts right then and there. And I like to, uh, say it's it starts as a process and i'll try to explain that we we create a a system through which the author can organize their thoughts and their knowledge so an author usually is a mountain guide who has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of routes on his or her uh, database however they're mapping whether it's caltopo or on x or google earth or infox is another popular guiding platform and I try to organize that into what we have in the product, both in our books, our maps, and in your app. 
um, something that's organized and easy to, to understand, right? And so we start with that process, make it so that they can write it down and make it easy for themselves because they have busy lives. And this is usually a labor of love for these guides. And then make a plan for how they're going to actually execute this book and get it through to the end. And, um, and then they follow the system that we have to actually make this uh, go from just a whole bunch of routes and ideas and notes to uh, a guidebook. And so we start, of course, with the person who has an authority on the area, right? That's the, that's the first piece of reliability. The, the second is that I hold them to a standard of making sure that when they draw this line, that they feel good about it. And when they describe the line, they feel like they're describing it well. We start by uh, taking the region, let's say a region such as Berthoud Pass outside of Denver. And then we divide that region into zones or sectors, depending on, on who we're talking to. But it's small areas that we usually define as an area that shares a skin track and shares descents and an exit. So it's usually like a bowl or a face of a peak or something like that. And then we can, once we have that zone, then we can start defining the features of that zone as it relates to traveling through avalanche terrain. So um, how steep is it? Where is it steep? What is the steepest point of the slope? Are there terrain traps? What are the terrain traps? What are they like? What is the behavior of the, the typical weather or your typical snowpack on that slope? Elevation, tree line characteristics, and then forest density. We'll take all of that and we try to either just represent that with a little icon, like a slope angle and a number, or the aspect icon that's on every one of our pictures that you see in this slide. Um, or we try to get the author to write that information down and then th with three different editors, we try to condense that to as brief of a sentence as possible, because we know we have these days a short attention span and most people don't read large guidebooks anymore. They're looking for pictures and the most important sentence in the book, myself included. So that is where we start. And that's the first draft. And we spend the next few months going through draft after draft after draft, refining all that information. And then once we feel like we have something we can share, then we share it with other guides in the area or prolific skiers, people like myself who ski the area may not be a mountain guide, but have spent a lot of time in there. And we ask for review and advice and adjustments. And we almost always get them. That's a really important piece of the process. And then we go through about five more drafts before we actually can publish the thing and put it into a book and a map and an app. And I talk a lot about this book and map and app. Um, I'll speak to that for just a minute. And that is, um, I'm, I was a carpenter, career carpenter by trade before I started this company. And uh, on any given job, I would have eight different types of saws with me on the job. And that's how I view these products that we've created. They're different tools for different jobs. A paper book can be super helpful, especially in the house, especially in the car, sharing with friends, looking at it, dreaming, scheming. A map, waterproof, tearproof, no batteries, can fit in your pocket and can get you out of a really tough situation in pea soup, whiteout conditions in the cold. And it's really great for planning and really also, in my opinion, if you're a map geek like me, it's a beautiful thing. The app, I don't even know if I have to speak to the advantages of the app. I mean, powerful tool with the flashy blue dot that we've all uh, used in super dicey situations before. I'm so glad when I was in a, where was I? I was in a Bariloche, Argentina outside the Frey hut. No, it was Lopez hut and got caught in a pea soup storm and couldn't even see the tips of my skis and literally followed the route that I had recorded that day back to the hut, like watching my blue dot and just moving. And I felt like I was in a ping pong ball and I was like, well, here's a good case for the app. So different tools for different jobs, right? So yeah, I'd like to um, kind of explain then that is why I started actually, I, that's when I started taking apps pretty seriously it was after that, that day when I was by myself. Um, in a ping pong ball using an app to get me home. Um, 
Onyx and we and I started talking to each other and it morphed into this relationship that we have now and I really I was encouraged when they started talking about reliability and responsibility before I did and all the ideas and plans they had for their app and for this user experience they've created and um I, I really wouldn't be talking to them if they hadn't, if they weren't taking it as seriously as they are. And I think they probably feel the same way about me. So uh, it's been a really cool journey seeing this whole product roll out. I've been geeking out on it for sure. So. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Cause I think that that's, that's kind of like approaching it from the map side, right? That, that process that you go to through that editorial process is like, you know, something that we strive for at Onyx, like the, the data that we put out there, you know, to the best of our abilities, based off of where they come from with like, you know, making sure that we present in a good way. So great partnership. And um, should we take a look at some, some digital uh, guidebooks? Um, great, cool. So we'll jump over to the product demo. All right. Um, so this is uh, Onyx Backcountry. You have um, so many of you may have seen it. If you haven't, I'm going to give you a quick overview um, so then we can dive into the, to the meat and potatoes. Um, so it's a it's a digital map. We cover um, all of North America, the United States and uh, in Canada um, with with our full featured um, map, although it works like elsewhere. Um, we uh, this map is organized kind of in two modes. Uh, like I mentioned before, trail mode, and you'll see kind of like the way that we display the map actually changes. Um, we'll show um, trails um, uh, for, for hiking and trail running and backpacking. Um, whereas for uh, in snow mode, um, it's a totally different set of data. This is where we're gonna find um, all of the Beak Guidebook content, uh, as well as all the information that um, kind of will go, we'll, we'll run through as you, um, as you plan your ski tour. So based off of two modes, like um, we we for each mode, we bring in map layers and sort of trail content that we um, that's sort of more specific to that mode to try to kind of reduce the amount of decisions that you need to make um, to make your to make your map um, show you everything that you need it to show you. We also have a basic suite of um, of GPS planning tools, so a route builder, um, being uh, ability to add waypoints, define areas, um, or even add uh, photos to uh, to locations on the map. Um, and all of this is stuff that you then, um, it's your own, right? You get to curate your map and, and build it out. And we'll, again, go into more detail about that. Um, continuing around the horn, um, we've got satellite um, and topo views. And then hybrid is topo overlaid on uh, on satellite. Um, each of these is useful in different, different uh, situations, depending on what your preference is. Um, we're fully functional, at least in, in web map and, um, and um, yeah, I guess on the mobile devices too, um, uh, 3D. So you can zoom around in 3D, which is really awesome. And just wait till you see your guidebook in 3D, Andy. Um, we've got weather uh, functionality, so you can pull point forecasts. Um, you can see your annual stats if you like to track in our app. Um, all of these tools I mentioned over here on the right um, are organized in my content. Um, so you can create folders and have um, all the content that you have made on your map accessible, and it's where you can turn it on and off, export, import, all those things. Um, you can define offline maps. Obviously, we're looking at the web version here. Um, when uh, I'll demo the mobile app as well, but taking taking everything that you do here, all of this date, all of these maps, all of this content, and taking it offline with you is a super critical part. Of of what Onyx Backcountry's value is, like you can everything that you do in um, in the comfort of your own home for planning, you can take with you in the field. Um, and finally, um, we kind of we have this discover card over here, which these are the um, the guidebooks that um, that we've uh, brought in from Andy, um, and that's kind of where um, we'll we'll focus a bit today. Um, great, and. I'll also mention as I'm going through this demo, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of, uh, of your Zoom uh, control panel. Um, so as you have questions, um, plop them in the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna be, um, my colleague is gonna be sending them to me and I'll try to answer them uh, as we go. And if I don't answer them as we go, 
we'll have some time at the end to uh, to answer questions. So yeah, anything that seems confusing or you want more clarity on, or um, pop it in the uh, in the Q and A. Awesome, great. Well, to kind of show what we've got going on in this um, with these uh, guidebooks that Andy has uh, authored and that we are uh, have digitized, um, we'll start over here in this Discover card. So let's say I live in Denver. Um, the Discover card will show you all of the um, like organized by by uh, proximity. Um, we'll show you um, the guidebooks um, that that we have available for those particular regions. Um, so one thing that's really cool about um, having high quality content like Beacon has has authored and then a digital mapping tool like Onyx is that we can overlay uh, and combine data and information in a way that helps you as you're planning um, make safer uh, and more informed decisions. So you can see right off the bat, like for, for Berthoud Pass, Loveland Pass, all of these different regions that we have guidebooks for, we're also pulling in the avalanche forecast um, from CAIC, um, as well as like referencing the snow tail stations that we know are in those um, in those regions uh, and reading out their, their depth and 24 hour accumulation. So let's say I'm in Denver and um, uh, and I'm and I woke up in the morning. I'm psyched to go backcountry skiing. It's early. I'm going to beat the traffic. Um, I may pull up this view and say, like, hey, well, where's what's the avalanche forecast doing in my zones? Well, turns out in Colorado, uh, it's a little sketchy. <laughs> so um, like a typical which, December in Colorado here. <laughs> maybe maybe typical. Um, it might take going to maybe if I could jump on a plane to go to. Um, to Washington, we'd be in we'd be in better shape. Um, but today, let's say I'm I love national parks. I'm going to go check out Rocky Mountain. That's where that's where I want to go. Um, so you can click into your Rocky Mountain zone, and now we're looking at um, the Rocky Mountain zone. And you can see it also shows up on the map. You can access it through the map as well if you uh, um, if you so choose. Um, so here. Andy mentioned a little bit about um, like the process that goes into into authoring their guidebooks, and so Rocky Mountain National Park is really, you know, if you bought Andy's book, it's it's a complete guidebook. It's um, and uh, and and like that's that's the actual book that you buy is Rocky Mountain National Park. And so the Rocky Mountain National Park though is broken up like in the book as chapters into these into zones. And Andy mentioned that a little bit as um, what was it, Andy like uh, zones are defined by common exit or approaches and exits yeah in general um, you know, like uh, we try to find zone, like an area that has common characteristics that you can usually see with a camera <laughs> so that we can take a photo of it uh and yeah the the descents within that zone will usually share an approach or two approaches if that's the the character of the area um it'll usually share a, a water drainage basin so it's often defined by the ridges surrounding it and uh, usually shares an exit parking lot and uh that's what we that's that's usually how we define a zone uh there's there's no every rule of thumb is broken so by some new piece of terrain but yeah that's that's the idea yeah cool and so you can see here um like you can look at a list of all of the, all of the zones um this is your uh this is your uh table of contents if you will um and today, let's say, so we know the avalanche danger is considerable. Um, so I, I want to be able to make terrain choices based off of um, that avalanche danger, which probably means that I want to keep terrain uh, pretty simple, at, stay out of avalanche terrain under, um, uh, stay on slopes under than 30 degrees. Um, so what's a way that we can quickly uh, like orient ourselves to that decision? That's this. Uh, eights rating and eight stands for the avalanche train exposure scale um and you can see we have complex challenging and there it is uh simple um so lower hidden valley in this case is uh uh would be simple i think is there any other zones in here that are simple no we're gonna so maybe hidden valley is actually if i want to ski in if i want to ski in the park today this is probably like it, it's a zone that will have will have a uh, train that that i'm looking for so if I click into Hidden Valley, we'll zoom in there. 
And so now we're kind of now at, at the at the base level of, of the guidebook. We're looking at what are the approaches, what are the ski lines, what are the options. Um, and and from here I can start to actually get in the weeds of planning my tour. Um, zooming back out to uh oops, sorry, I went one one too far. Looking at our um looking at our, our zone, um, we have like descriptions of that zone, like how to access it, um, as well as like a list of all the uh, all the descents that are that are in the book, the approaches to get to those descents um, and the exits. So we've kind of taken Andy's book, organized it, and also put it on the map um, for you to for the, to plan your tour. So I do want to talk about eights a little bit more um, because it's a pretty it's a it's a scale that is um, was developed by uh, Avalanche Canada or a researcher in in Canada and is widely adopted in in Canada. Um, but it's a way of simplifying, um, like I said, that that decision making of like, what type of train do I want to be skiing today? Um, and so you can see here in in Lower Hidden Valley, we're talking about simple train. So so what is simple train? We we tried to um, give you a, a brief overview here, um, like in the app, exposure to low angle or primarily forested train. Some force openings may involve run out zones of infrequent avalanches, many options to reduce or eliminate expo exposure. But how do we classify this? Because um you know if you think you're in simple train and you're actually in challenging train that can be that that's a problem that's something that we don't want that that we that's not a mistake that we want you to make and that's um something that we take a lot of care out so jumping over to beacon's handy uh website where they um kind of go into more detail about what the avalanche train exposure scale is andy do you want to tell us a little bit about um like what's your process for identify for you know deciding which um, eights rating uh, line or zone might fit into. Um, and yeah, tell us a little bit about like how you use eights uh, to communicate train. Yeah, this is kind of the system part of the authoring process that we go through. I have a, I took the rubric that Parks Canada invented uh, to, to help identify, to help categorize and classify each piece of terrain. And we do it by zone. Once again, we'll take what we've talked about these these particular zones that share an approach and uh, descends into a drainage and share an exit. And we'll say, okay, let's look at this zone. We have an aerial photo of it. We have uh, Google Earth. We have Onyx. We have Topo Maps. Let's look at this terrain and let's go through the rubric. Um, do you have the rubric? I do, actually. One sec. Oh, oh yeah. So, yeah, it's over there on the sweet um as you can see it's organized just as a as a basic spreadsheet uh that is broken into the three levels of simple challenging complex this is green blue and black which is unfortunate because runs of difficulty at ski resorts are also green blue and black but this does not relate to difficulty green blue and black and the eight scale are specifically talking about avalanche exposure as it relates to those of us skiing through it so as you can see there's a whole bunch of different categories to fill out so we're looking at lower hidden valley for example and we say okay slope angle are they generally below 30 degrees are they mostly low angle with small isolated slopes above 35 degrees or are they variable uh, with large percentage of the slopes above 35 degrees in the case of Lower Hidden Valley, we highlighted number one, simple, and we go on to slope shape. I'm not going to go through every row and column. You're welcome. But this is what our authors do is for every single zone, we go through this rubric and we highlight. And then once we're done highlighting each individual box for where that area qualifies, then we boil it down to uh, the result. And as you can see, some of these are bolded and a bolded means a default. That means even if the zone qualified for everything in the number one column, except for the default of it has isolated exposure uh, or a, a traveler has isolated exposure to start zones and tracks, then it automatically bumps that piece of terrain into the next category up. So there's some some features, some qualifiers that just we say, like, if the person is going to cross an avalanche slope, even though otherwise they're all day in simple terrain, this is a com this is a challenging tour. Right, this is a challenging area, so that's that's basically how this works. And our authors go through it, and then I check it and I cross-examine them basically, 
and then we usually have someone else cross-examine them. Grant Statham, the inventor of eights, uh, also gets all of our books and maps in the mail, and I ask him to look through it, and he usually does. Gives us some critical feedback, and usually gives us a thumbs up, says, nice job. Um, thanks for using it. So am I, get, am I getting too in the weeds here, Charlie? I get really excited about eights. I, get, I can like do this all day long. Let's do this. Um, well, let's, let's um, if we dive back into, the, uh, into, our, into our lower valley, lower hidden valley um, area too. So like all of those parameters that you, that you were just uh, mentioning, right? Like um, slope angles below, um, 30 degrees, um, like primarily treed, like, um, looking for train traps, um, part of, uh, so like, while, while Andy has tried to do that work, uh, for us, um, you know, and, and defining something as simple, um, what's cool is that, uh, and what's important for, for playing backcountry tour is to also have like the context, uh, that goes into that so that you can be out there and, and understand the decisions um, that you're making um, when you're in the backcountry. So we'll leave the guidebook here for a second. Um, I, I did see we got a question about um, what do the different uh, colors of lines mean? And um, I think the most important thing here is that these purple lines that are in snow mode, and these purple lines are things that we've curated and come from the guidebook. Um, and uh, if I were to turn them off, right, then th th now we're kind of more in our, um, in our general, general base map here um we do have a legend down here in the bottom right um to understand like land areas and and how we how we do trails so um you can dig into that um uh, if you need more context um so cool we're, we're we're interested in hidden valley we've we've gone through our we've we've flipped through our guidebook and we've ended up here um other tools that we have at our disposal so i mentioned the avalanche forecast earlier um we saw it over here in the in the uh, in the context of these regions, um, but you can also view it as a layer. So if I zoom way out, all these crazy colors here. Oops, sorry, I'm making you not nauseous. Get, make it clear. So all of these orange colors here are the avalanche forecast issued by CAIC, and you can um, you can click on it. Um, you'll see avalanche forecast from the zone and a link out to the avalanche forecast. So that's a really important important part about understanding. Uh, or planning your tour is understanding what the, what's the avalanche problem for the today. Um, kind of based off of considerable and our choice to go to um, to Hidden Valley. Um, you know, maybe our maybe our decision uh, is to stay out of avalanche strain um, altogether. So so again, looking at Rocky Mountain National Park, going to Lower Hidden Valley, or Lower Hidden Valley rather. Um, we. Also have here um, the ability to investigate slope angles uh, yourself. So just like Andy mentioned, like slopes generally less than 30 degrees are uh, are preferable or, or, or necessary for um, for terrain to be simple, for it to be um, to reduce your exposure to avalanche terrain. Um, so you can see in the scale up here, this this zone looks to be mostly that kind of nice green and yellow, um, which which looking for large swaths of green and yellow is absolutely my favorite thing. You can find uh, awesome skiing and uh, with some exceptions, uh, eliminate or re significantly reduce your avalanche exposure. Um, so cool, now we, you have the context that you, um, once, once you're actually looking in here and trying to decide which way to go, you can, you can help use this to help supplement um, you know, the work that Andy's done to say like, hey, this is simple terrain. Also with that, like avalanche forecasts will uh, often say things like the avalanche problem is on a persistent weak slab on northeast facing slopes, uh, you know, at or above tree line. Um, like that's the type of language that um, that avalanche centers will use. Um, so slope angle being one of the ways to mitigate risk, but aspect one of the, being one of the ways to identify where that risk exists. Um, so using our aspect layer, you can see like, okay, cool, we're looking at um, you know, based off our little uh, uh, legend over here, um, we're looking at sort of mostly north aspects over here, maybe again into a little bit northeast, um, and a much more southeast aspect if I wanted to come uh, head over to the windows, but um, but that's also in uh, upper in upper Hidden Valley, so maybe I don't want to actually venture all the way over there. So. 
through slope angle and slope aspect, you can sort of investigate um, some of the things that the avalanche uh, uh, forecast is telling you. Um, and then again, like supplementing uh, the information that Andy's written. But what's great is Andy has done most of this work for us. Um, so again, if we go back to our sort of lower Hidden Valley uh, zone description, um, the uh, and we wanted to choose our descent for the day, right? So we're looking at um, okay, lift line or uh, or spruce being sort of two um, two potential lines, and with an approach of it looks like that Aspen approach is going to get us exactly where we want to go. So maybe we want to investigate Aspen. Um, we can see we can get elevation gain and distance. Um, you know, again, kind of what Andy said in terms of distilling lines down to a uh, down to some stats, like we understand it's 30 degrees max. We love that for our avalanche exposure. Um, and again, it's a, it's simple terrain. Um, cool. Andy, anything to add about um, how you, how you think about, um, you know, building out these zones and, uh, um, and kind of the approaches and, or any, any tips that you would have for folks um, as you're, they're using your guidebook to, to plan their tours? Yeah, a couple things come to mind. So this area was authored by Mike Susi. He's an IFMGA guide, has been skiing there for 25 years. Uh, this is this particular spot, Lower Hidden Valley, is uh, where the majority of their Avalanche Level 1 courses at Colorado Mountain School uh, are held. So it's it, it gets moguled out sometimes during dry spells this is a this is a popular place to go because rocky mountain national park is inherently very steep and there's not very many simple zones to go to um so this this is a popular place to go it's cool that you zoomed in on this I, it just for for viewers who maybe didn't catch it charlie is in montana he does not ski lower hidden valley very much he just started out by out in space basically looking down on the map and saying it's considerable today i'd like to look for simple terrain great choice and he's found it from montana <laughs> off the couch and uh and and he's he's shooting from the hip and he's nailing it so that's that's kind of a cool thing to see a cool demonstration the other thing i just like to point out i think this is a good spot to say it is that Lines on a map for backcountry skiing are a little uh, they're they're not super representative of backcountry skiing, right? And I think it's I think it's important. I try to put this all over disclaimers in my book. I know that Onyx spends some time speaking to this, but you don't ski a straight line <laughs> down lift line. yet someone's drawn a, a straight line. We recommend routes lift line is actually kind of a straight line so it's kind of funny that i'm saying this here but the point is when you're backcountry skiing and you're using these fancy apps and you're using these hot new books and maps keep your brain on this you are so you're supposed to also be looking at the slope angle that's why onyx has provided slope angle shading everywhere not just over the lines that's why um, you are still taking avalanche classes our maps, our books, all these apps, no matter how good they get, they will not replace a professional mountain guide um, who actually does tell you exactly where to go. These are suggesting routes. They're, they're good guidelines. They're somewhere for you to get your, get your feet wet, look around, and keep your brain on, make your own decisions. Don't just follow that flashy blue dot unless yeah. you can't see anything and then maybe default to that. But I think you get my point. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the important thing. That is a really important thing here. Right. And that's why, um, again, we're uh, slope angle, slope aspect, um, being able to see the terrain underneath it. Like these are all parts of being able to plan a complete tour. And the guy, like Andy said, the guidebook is like, it's a way, it's a way to orient yourself to a, to a zone. Um, and, and then from there you can, the, the adventures are endless. Like you, you don't have to ski there. In fact, it's probably maybe not recommended to, to ski exactly the line. Um, but, but like I said, it gives you that context, that context of the area. Um, cool. So we have, um, there was a couple questions that I'll address before we move into kind of more, okay, cool. Now we've got, we've got this content on the map. How do I actually go about planning and executing this? Um, so one question was around, is there a way to filter to pare down uh, line selection? Um, and if you go up here in this, um, sort of snow mode, 
button, you can you can filter by length, elevation loss, uh, and low and high point. Um, we're actually um, you know working on expanding that so you can filter by eights and all those things. But uh, but yes, yeah, so for now you can filter by um, by these these three parameters. Um, and then we also had a question. Well, actually, I'll get to that one. I'll get to that one in a second about about waypoints. Um, and then we have a question about um, uh, will we have more map layers in the future? So you can see that we actually um, we only have three layers in snow mode. Um, it's a little bit deceiving because we actually pack a whole bunch more data on here than than it seems. So you can sort of choose your act, which like uh, activity you want to see kind of guidebook data for. So obviously, ski touring is what we're talking about today, and has that's kind of where we have the most coverage. Um, we also like public land. Turn this off to show it. So these these outlines here, these colors, um, those are all public land and of different types. So Rocky Mountain National Park is this um, nice pink one, and then we've got national forest land over here, um, uh, BLM, all of the all the different public land classifications. Um, and then in trail mode, we we kind of curate a different set of of information for you there too. Um, and so. So yes, we're always looking to add more data and always looking to add more layers, um, but we don't necessarily operate in the same way as some as like pulling in geo PDFs or anything. We're trying to again um, curate that curate that experience a little bit um, uh, for you. Cool. And then one more question about where the legend is again. If you come down to this little map uh, sat two D button down here on the right, it's in the legend tab. Great, cool. So let's move on to um, okay. Now we we've 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 defined where we want to go, um, and uh, and now we need to plan a ski tour. Like, sweet, this is this is the fun part. Yeah, um, let's do it. Let's do it. So, Andy, I mean, I'm guessing the first thing that we need to check for is um, how much did it snow? What is the snow doing uh, in our zone? Um, what are, yeah, what's, yeah. what's your pre-tour, what's your pre-tour checklist? Do you, would you say as you're, as you're, you've woken up in the morning or you're, you're, it's the evening before, like what are, what are the things that you're looking for? Well, I'll, I'll steal directly from Mike Susi, the author of this guidebook. Last time we had a, a, a talk, uh, at, at REI, uh, he's a very good instructor, very good teacher. And, uh, he talks when he talks about tour planning, whether it's himself or he's got a group of students. You look at three things. It's always three things, right? You've got hazards, yeah, route, yeah. and then time. Let's break it down into those three things, right? So let's identify the hazards. That's why you said first and foremost, let's look at the snow. How much did it snow? Zero or a bunch or somewhere in between? Um, and or in the case of Rocky Mountain National Park, how much blew in from the west side into the east side? <laughs> because yeah. it's windy. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure it's blowing there as we speak. And uh, actually, you guys have some pretty cool tools to identify that. Do you want to go into snow tail and wind? Yeah, I will, I'll do that real quick, and then we'll and we'll get to your. So we're assessing hazard, right? So we we already talked about avalanche forecast, um, but so these uh, black snowflake icons all around the map, you'll see them all around the western United States. Um, those are snow tail stations, which stand for snow telemetry, which are um, sort of federally uh, managed uh, remote senses or sensors for um, measuring snow depth. Um, and so we can tap into those as skiers and see like, cool, in these uh, points in the backcountry, like how much did it snow? So you can see here at Willow Park, we have zero inches of accumulation, uh, 20 inches of depth. That's enough to go skiing. Um, looks like the wind sensor might be not reporting great there, but you can see a seven day plot of each of these uh, pieces of data. So Wind speed over, you mentioned wind speed. Um, not every, I'll say not every snow tail station has wind speed, but this one does. So that's awesome. But it looks like we've had kind of peaks of in the 20s, um, an average of around 15 over the course of the last 24 hours, dying down a bit. Um, we can look at snow water equivalent and see that it's been pretty flat, but but there's been, there was some recent loading um, over the course of Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and again, temperature, maybe this is a little bit more useful in the springtime when you're looking for melt um freeze thaw cycles but it's cold so um cold would be another hazard i would add into that and so that's looking in the past and the other um we also can drop these point forecasts um so if you tap this little weather 
icon down here on the bottom. And again, everything I'm showing you is in the web tool, which, you know, for planning a tour, it's nice to sit. If you have a laptop and you can sit at home, it's, I highly recommend it. But um, while some of these features, like for example, this point forecast one is not available on mobile, we have, we, we do our best to keep parity between the experiences. So you, you can do, you can find snow tiles, you can do all that stuff. You can ex examine the guidebook all in mobile as well. So quickly looking at weather too, um, you can look at uh, weekly, uh, weekly forecasts. Looks like, oh shoot, we're not gonna get any snow until next Wednesday um, and hourly forecast as well. But just like you said, the forecast here is for 18 miles an hour, minus four degrees. That's cold. All right, so so now we know how much it's gonna how much it's gonna snow, which is maybe minimal. How much it has snowed and what the wind has done over the last um, over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, what else are you looking for, Andy? Those are those are the really good ones. I mean, that's the, the the temporal hazards, the the things that are dynamic and changing. You've got you've got weather, wind, snowpack. The snowpack, luckily in this case, and when most cases these days we have a local avalanche forecast and that will tell you what's happening underneath the snow that's dynamic and the other things that i you know i just i'm thinking about the the three ski tours i've been on in the last week uh we've got the you we, we're looking at some red flags here right we're seeing considerable conditions that's that's pretty bad right we're seeing cold temps yeah. we're seeing an awful snowpack we're seeing um, in some places new snow, in some places wind slabs. Just even if there, there wasn't new snow, we're seeing uh, wind transport. The other things that um, I had a I had a tour this week uh, with some friends. It was five of us, and that to me the night before, I would write down as a hazard. I'd say you know any any more than three people, I think is is a, is a hazard. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be thought about. And so I thought about it the night before. All right. We need to do um, a more thorough beacon check at the beginning. We need to discuss our descent options at the top because I know we're going to be going through uh, some glades where there's three different options and one goes through avalanche terrain. What are we going to do? So that to me is another hazard. And then um, there's the that's, there's the hazards along the way too that happen. Are my fingers cold? Am I eating enough? Am I hydrated? Is there somebody in the group who's shutting down? Stuff like that. So those are those are hazards along the way, but we can go back in time to just the planning stage, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, and so one thing that's important in all that is like, uh, is how long are you going to be out there? Um, uh, and like, what are your, like, what are your uh, route options? Um, and, and like, What's if you go through a planning process, you also then have better context once you're out in the field to like make adjustments based off of what you're seeing in the snowpack, whether you're finding those wind slabs, whether your fingers are too cold and you really need to hike it back to the car. Um, so while we've chosen here, we've we've ended up at Hidden Valley because it's we it's considerable and we're not we're interested in staying simple today. So so maybe there's this is a small zone, fewer options, but um, but so one thing you can do to to help start to um, understand like how long you're out there, what's the exertion that you're going to be doing. Um, and, uh, and then also where do you need to be, where do you need to be thinking heads up about, um, uh, about avalanche concerns or, or other hazards. Um, so you can create a route, um, which in this case I could, I could, uh, Andy again has done the work for me. Oops, sorry. Uh, discard that he's done the work for me. And I know that, okay, this Aspen, this Aspen line, it gains 651 feet. It looks like I have a little bit of approach from this parking lot over here, which I did get a question about, um, do all the approaches start and end at the parking lot? Um, and I think the answer here is that like some of these ascents will will start like from accessible zones, but Andy, you guys, in your books, you you do mark parking lots and, um, uh, and, and access points and sort of again, describe them in your, uh, in those zone descriptions as well. Um, yeah. So while they're not marked on the map, we kind of try to provide the context of where you can park. Oh, yeah, they're saying like, where are the parking spots? Totally. Yeah. yeah. In the book, we usually do try to talk about it unless it's so darn complicated that I'm I don't, I'm not confident to put it in print in 2000 books. And I might be uh, having people park at a, a place where they're going to get towed. So I, I, I only put and recommend parking spots uh, where I feel confident to recommend it. And that's another good example of 
keep your own brain on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta pay attention here. To, but, but kind of the inverse of that question was do, do all exits and approaches start at, at parking areas? Um, here we have one, this approach for the upper hidden valley um, to the left of your red dot there, Charlie. Yeah, that approach starts halfway up. Uh, that that is on Trail Ridge Road. That is closed for the winter. You're not parking there. Uh, so that's that's basically you're going from the lower hidden valley zone to the upper hidden valley zone. And that's where uh, reading the description of this approach, you'll learn that kind of stuff. You don't need to be necessarily guessing where that starts and ends. I also see a question here just while we're in this spot, Charlie. Uh, someone says, "What resort included the lift line?" So just a cool piece of history. Hidden Valley used to be a ski area outside of Estes Park uh, many years ago when I was a little kid and it shut down uh, sometime when I was a little kid. I can't remember the exact year, but it was a little mom and pop uh, ski area in the park. And uh, and it's been overgrowing slowly ever since. There, The trees are getting taller in the lift line and in that in those runs, but those actually used to be little ski trails. So pretty cool piece of history. Cool, yeah. Um, that's why it's so straight. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the one, the one line that you actually follow the line. Um, cool. So, so like you mentioned, um, or so, like I was, I was mentioning. Um, so let's let's turn our slope angle on here, um, and by building a route. So we have um, again this tool up in the top right where you can build a route, um, and we're going to start in this parking lot. Luckily, we can see it. It looks like a pretty well-defined parking lot. Um, and uh, I'm gonna head out here. So luckily when you're backcountry skiing, um, we, the route builder will snap to trails as you go, but um, these these uh, ski lines again are like, they're, uh, they're an overlay, not necessarily a trail. So we're, um, when you're skiing, you get to, you get the joy of just drawing freehand um, using this point draw. Um, and so we're gonna kind of follow up this approach and start to head up uh, Hidden Valley. So really the reason to, to plot routes like this, like again, Andy's done a lot of the work for us. So in this case, maybe it's, maybe it's, um, it's moot. Um, but the reason to this is that you can, you can see here on the left, you can see the, the distance and the elevation gain um, as you're going. And let's say like, I'm feeling, okay, the avalanche danger is considerable. I've done some research. And um, I understand that the problem is, uh, I'm going to make this up, but uh, it's persistent weak layer on north aspects with, um, uh, with wind loading. Um, and probably um, true. But I, that's probably true. <laughs> Excuse me, Colorado, just enough to know that. Um, <laughs> but let's say I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested in like staying in super simple terrain, but, um, but going up above lift line in this case and like poking around in these trees. Um, and as I'm coming up here, I'm starting to see like, okay, well, actually there's, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing much more, um, uh, much more orange and red here. So that would kind of get my hackles up. And so maybe right about here or where we would bust out of, um, bust out of tree line here, right? Um, so you can see, okay, cool. I've gained another, uh, or 1200 feet from the parking lot. Um, and I'm now I'm not a decision point. So one thing that we like to do, and we've we've worked with guides on this as well, is like as you're as you're starting to customize these tour plans, right? So we've got these we've got these nice ascent routes um, and and context, and and again we can look at this and say like, okay, well, hey, we're entering avalanche terrain exposure scale, scale challenging here, right? Like, and that sort of checks out with what we're seeing in these in these slope angles. Um, but when you're planning your tour and getting meticulous like this, you can use the route builder to understand. Um, Oops, sorry, you can use the route builder to understand um, your yeah, distance mileage, which can translate to time. I saw a question about Munter calculation. Super good question. Um, something that we're that we're that we're working on. Um, for now, I I would say like as you start start to tour, you start to understand like how how fast can you climb? So like a thousand feet an hour is for a fit person is like a decent marker, but it's gonna depend, you kind of have to find your own your own um, measurement there, which is again, why doing simple tours like this is a great a great way to get out there. Um, but so you can create your route and like, let's say I wanted to poke, I want to poke up here, but I'm not committed to going into this train um, by any means. I want to stay well out of the run out areas in the, in the old growth forest. Um, and I'm going to put a waypoint here that maybe says, 
hazard, um, do not pass. And um, we can see it was in, in customizing these, uh, this map, right? Adding, adding waypoints, adding, um, and, and being able to sort of customize with this really fun uh, <laughs> amount of, um, like you can have a skin track, snow pit, um, ski touring zone, but as you as you start to spend more time spending and planning tours, you you can customize these, and then it becomes really easy to read. So when you're out here in the field, this will sync right to your mobile phone, and you'll be like, "Cool, I've reached the point where I don't want to go up anymore." Now this might be a little bit of a of a you know I'm I'm just looking for more elevation gain here, <laughs> but most likely I'm just going to ski right back down the lift line and and head home, given what I know about the the conditions for the day. Um, and so while I, this is sort of a very simple simple basic um, example of a tour. Um, you can also then add this into a folder. So let's call this my Hidden Valleys uh, tour. Great. I'm going to take that, um, add it to my folder as well. Awesome. So now really these, these folders are a good way of organizing stuff into um, into tours so that you can then, or into complete plans so that you can then share them um, with your tour partner and and whatever else. Um, cool. So we're bumping up, um, I'm gonna be conscious of time here. Um, and I think we've covered a good bit of, um, of what's possible in the mobile app. And so I'm gonna quickly um, jump over to, or sorry, we've covered what's in the web map. I'm gonna quickly jump over to our um, mobile app just so you can see um, how this then translates into um, into uh, the the navigation experience. Charlie, real quick, we had a question um, in the mobile app when you're in the field. Can you tell your uh, current elevation? Yeah. So absolutely. So you can should be able to see here my uh, my mobile device, um, and and the app in my mobile phone. I'm going to turn off our avalanche forecast. So up here in the top left, I can't point to it, unfortunately, but you can see it up there in the top left. It says 4,798 feet. Um, that is my elevation in Bozeman. Um, and uh, so, yeah, as you're moving, you'll see your, you'll see your elevation. Cool. So um, now that we're in our mobile phone, you can see this plan that I had made um, is, uh, is available. And I can turn on slope angle. And while I'm in the field, I can like make assessments um, just as I was while I was planning uh, in the in the field here, or sorry, on the on the web map. Um, so the final step here in planning my in in planning my tour would be okay. Well, actually, maybe I I want to make sure that I uh, will show lift line. Oops, show lift line. Cool. So we still have got lift line. Our intention is oh yeah well. We've we've read the forecast in the morning, and we definitely want to make sure that like this is where we're going to ski. This is where we like we like trying to transition here at the top. So we're gonna we can add more waypoints. Maybe let's make it green. Awesome. Um, so if you in the bottom nav here, if you go to offline maps, you can then create a new map, um, choose your resolution. Uh, you can name it if you'd like, uh, and uh, save it. And so one thing that we've tried to do to make it easy is that um, everything that um, like the slope angle layers, all, all of the layers that you see here, like automatically get uh, automatically get downloaded. You don't have to choose um, which ones uh, are there or not. Um, one thing I will say is that um, some of the the region level, uh, this the Rocky Mountain National Park level information that we kind of were talking about earlier, um, that does not go offline with you yet. Um, but all of the ski lines that we that we mentioned or that are on the map uh, will. And so with that, you're ready to plan your tour. And you, once you're at your at your parking lot, maybe um, uh, you can mark your mark your car or your truck. Let's see, truck. Or maybe I was camping. I probably wasn't camping, uh, given the weather forecast that we saw. Um, truck, there it is. Um, and then in the bottom right here, you can start your tracker. And just like Andy mentioned um, about uh, while you were in Argentina, um, using the tracker is a great way to to remember where you've been. You can build a catalog of all of the uh, all of the um, places that you've toured and like what the right exits and um, 
uh, and approaches are. Um, and if you get caught in a whiteout, you can you can use it to breadcrumb your way um, back to your car. So tracking um, in the app is really useful because you can see your track um, right on the app as well. I almost always track now ever since that that day. It's 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 very easy. It doesn't seem to waste my battery any more than than if I'm not tracking. I keep my phone now. I have a all my base layer shirts for skiing. I can't believe I do this because I've always been so anti-tech. I'm a paper guy, right? But I I do it because it's smart. Uh, all my base layers now have a chest pocket with a zipper and a little cell phone holder, so it's always in a warm spot on my body. And uh, with my offline maps, airplane mode, tracking, I, I I have not had problems. And we're we're in the Gunnison Valley of Colorado. It's one of the coldest places in the lower 48. It's and uh, it's been a good solution for sure. Yeah, and that's an important point here, right? Is that like what what we um, you know we we have Onyx Onyx has learned from hours and hours and hours of people using their our app in the backcountry. And what's nice is that mobile phone technology has also gotten better, where battery life is is getting better. But but you have to take care of your phone and your app in the same way that you take care of any other piece of gear, right? Like you have to know what's the expected battery life? Like if it's, if you know that your phone is old and it turns off as soon as it touches the cold winter air, um, then it's, it's probably not a reliable tool for you. Um, whereas, uh, or you have to come up with ways to mitigate that. So it's kind of, um, it's an important point that as you're, as you begin to build, build reliance and, um, uh, and patterns of using tools like this for navigation, you have to take care of it the same way you would any other piece of gear, um, for sure. One thing, uh, there was a question that we got about waypoints and, and saving metadata for waypoints. You saw that I was playing around with the color and the icons, uh, but you can also, you can add photos um, and you can also just add notes to it. So I think that that was one of the questions that you asked. So like one, one use case that we've seen a lot is that um, you can save, kind of keep a catalog of your snow pits. So if you're um, digging snow pits, you're comfortable assessing snow, you can, um, uh, oops, sorry. So I made it a snow pit icon. Um, and I can now say like, whatever the snow pit results are that I want to log, you know, ECTP 11. And, um, you know, you could say you could say the aspect northeast aspect 8100 feet. Boom, there it is. The, uh, the date of when you created it is saved up there. And um, now you have a catalog of of some of your snow observations. Awesome, well, I'm gonna flip us back here to our uh, deck. We're at the end of the hour. Um, and here we are. Awesome, so I'll put this back up here as, um, and we've got a couple more questions that I'll go through and, and answer, um, but, uh, thank you all as you're, I know that we're at the end of the hour. So if you have to file off, um, make sure you get 30% off backcountry here. Um, and Andy, thanks so much for, for joining us and, and telling some of your story today. Um, which leads me to one of, uh, uh one of the questions in, um, uh, that we got, which is any plans for, uh, BC Canada guidebooks and zones. And another one was what's the plan to get more guidebooks, uh, into the app, um, you know, specifically for Oregon, central Oregon. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about how you, um, you know, what your plans are and what you're, and, uh, how we're looking to expand. Um, we're, we're always looking for authors and, uh, and we are working on releasing a similar amount next year as we did this year. We usually release in November and I tend not to mention the exact locations, not because I'm trying to be extra secret agent, mainly because uh, sometimes an author suddenly has a baby and stops making their book, or sometimes an author, uh, you know, moves to a different country, and and uh, we really don't know until we're at the finish line when things are actually going to be done. But we are working in many different states right now. We are creating products for places outside of the country in South America and Europe. And, uh, and we're always moving, but it's, it is a small team. There's really uh, three of us in the office and we use a professional cartographer, a professional graphic designer, photographer, and editor. 
those are, those are the other main team members. And then of course, uh, porting it into the Onyx platform is an, is it another epic adventure with, uh, with their whole team of, of crack agents in the back. So, um, more is coming and, uh, all you have to do is, is, uh, pay attention, watch us, follow us and you'll see where it comes from. But, uh, I don't know. Are you guys planning on on more areas, Charlie? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're obviously we're we're um, we are partners in this, so we'll uh, we'll be looking to uh, expand together. But also the um, you know the the process that you outlined and like how rigorous that is to to make sure that you have like well um, uh, responsible and reliable uh, guidebooks. Like that's something that that you know we feel um, committed to as well. But um, and uh, so yeah, but we're, you know, we're, we're in the mapping business and we're here to try to, cr you know, create maps that help people make decisions and, uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, lead to responsible outcomes. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, anybody can, can go ski a route, GPS it, and then put it up on the website and say, Hey, this was a sweet ski. It was good to go. And it was safe. Go get some. Yeah. And that's literally happened in some online platforms and some apps. And, uh, to me, that's absolutely frightening. And there's no no law saying you can't do it, um, but I think it's the, it's the products like yours that uh, will probably end up rising to the top because uh, you make sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen. But yeah, it's a good point. It takes a long time, and it's, it is a rigorous process to get these uh, books, you know, vetted, fact checked, reviewed, and all that stuff. So yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna. Uh, there's two more questions. If you have any more questions, pop them in the Q and A. Um, uh, we'll try, but. I think I've got time for maybe just two more. Um, so one question, uh, which is around a function in the product, which is, is there an automated way to add tracks from other apps like Strava with descriptions automatically imported into my content folder, folder or is the best way to manually import GPX files from those apps? At this time, uh, manually importing GPX files into those apps is the, uh, or into Onyx is the, um, uh, is the way to go. Um, and then you can do your customization in Onyx itself. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the, the metadata often from, from Strava won't, won't be exported with the GPX. Um, well, cool. another quick one was, uh, do you include information for the Eastern US? Um, or maybe that one was answered in chat. Um, the answer is like, uh, we do have information. We have our maps fully functional in the US or in the Eastern US. We have a few, um, you know, we, we work with Andy and Beacon, but we also pull in um, lines from other sources as well. Um, and we do have a few of those in the Eastern US. Um, great. And cool. I'm going to do one last question here. How does keeping the phone on affect the Beacon signal? And um, that's kind of an interesting one. That's um, I, I imagine you're talking about avalanche beacons. Um, no, keeping the beacon <laughs> map on. The beacon map. The yeah, maybe. That, um, uh, it's a it's a good question. It's I think that there's some discussion in the industry about it right now. Um, but definitely having your phone um, even in airplane mode next to your um, uh, beacon while you're in search mode will. Uh, it will it will give you ghost readings, um, so that is something that even though the phone, uh, I am of the opinion <laughs> that uh, having your phone is like a critical safety tool in the backcountry for um, you know to the extent that you need it for navigation uh, or emergency services or whatever. Um, uh, in the event of there being an avalanche and a beacon search needing to be carried out, um, both these expensive watches that we have and your phone um, have lithium ion batteries. Um, I think it's the battery management system that has the same frequency that a beacon can pick up. So the safest thing to do is to have them off. Um, and But the quick thing to do is to just try to get your body between your searching beacon and the phone. It's, there's a whole discussion there. I'm not an expert on it, um, but it's a good question because uh, we're talking about two you know, people's safety here. So um, Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, and I'd even argue that it's still, there's still research ongoing. So any statement anyone's making with absolute confidence right now is probably going to be disproven in the yeah, future. Uh, some of the like the companies like Backcountry Access, Mamut, they're doing lots of studies on it right now. It's worth paying attention to and and adapting. Don't don't uh, don't commit to a religion. Pay attention to the science and and listen. 
Absolutely. Great. Well, thanks everyone so much for tuning in. Um, we uh, hope you have a safe and snowy winter out there. And um, wh wherever wherever you are, if you if you don't live in the snow, I hope you get to uh, to to visit it um, at least once. Um, we're we're always open for feedback at Onyx. Um, so um, please reach out to our customer service team. They relay all the feedback to myself and our team. So um, as you um, have more questions and stuff, um, we're always open. Um, and with that, Andy, thanks so much for joining. Uh, happy Thank holidays, you. everyone. Great. And um, we'll see you uh, in the new year.